for coming out on such a night to hear our Bible-based address this evening. Tonight we wish to present to you the truth from the Bible, God's Word. We have it on our laps this evening. The truth about God's plan with this earth and the true message of the Gospel. So, the Bible we believe is the Word of God. It is inspired. And that means to breathe out. God breathed out. God breathed forth. It is infallible, we believe. It cannot be wrong. It cannot fail. It is therefore reliable, 100% reliable. And we believe that the Bible is the only authority that we can rely upon to direct our daily lives. And therefore, with a belief in the Bible, we can face the future with confidence. The Gospel, a New Testament term. That's what we find, my dear friends. The word Gospel appears many times in the Bible, but it only appears in the New Testament scriptures. And it means the glad tidings or the good news. It's a simple term which is used to describe the hope of the Bible. That is, the plan and the purpose of God with man and with the earth. And it revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, the chapter our chairman just read for us, we'll come to that a bit later on. The gospel is condensed <coughs> into a single brief statement. And that statement is addressed to Abraham, the man Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And that obviously doesn't apply to the world in which we live today. The world in which we live today is not blessed. That's one thing that's for sure. So that's a prophecy which is yet to be fulfilled, we believe. So the gospel is a message of hope contained within God's word and it will ultimately bring peace and God's righteousness to the whole earth. The term itself comes from a Greek word which I'll let you have a go at pronouncing. It's up there on the screen. From which we get the English word Evangel, which means good message. And Vine's Expository Dictionary, which is a well-recognised authority, says of this word, it says, In the New Testament, it denotes the good tidings of the Kingdom of God and of salvation through Christ to be received by faith. And that is exactly the teaching of the Bible, precisely. So we believe that the hope of the Bible is available, very much so, to us today if we have a correct understanding of the good news and the glad tidings contained within it. The Apostle Paul wrote concerning our hope and he shows very very clearly the difference between the word of God and the words of man and we see that when we turn to 1st of Thessalonians chapter 2 in 1st of Thessalonians chapter 2 we have this phrase the gospel of God appears three times in verse 2 in verse 8 and in verse 9, the Gospel of God. 
And then he links that with further words that he has in verses 11 to 13. Verse 11 for background. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. There's our hope. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, men, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So there it is, my dear friends. Verse 12 points out to us the responsibility which God requires of us that we would walk worthy of God. And that is our challenge, each and every one of us, to live acceptably before our God, that we might receive a reward. So God is inviting us to be part of the kingdom, his kingdom and glory, as it's stated there in verse 12, if we walk worthy of the calling. And then verse 13, we have that phrase, the word of God, which appears twice in that verse there. It was heard from the apostles, and we're reading it this evening on the page in front of us. That is the good news, that is the gospel, the glad tidings. And there's a contrast, isn't there, mate, in this verse, verse 13 there, between the word of man and the truth or the word of God. So what can the Word of God do for us? And the answer is contained within that verse. It is able to effectively work, which worketh effectively also in you that believe, the last phrase in that verse 13 there. The phrase effectually worketh. Another translation, the Rotherham translation says, which is also inwardly working itself in you that believe. So the word effectually, my dear friends, is in the Greek energio, from which we get the word energy, to energise, to be energised. And so what it's telling us is that the word of God is able to energize us. It's the fuel, it's the power which is able to motivate us in our daily lives. But we must believe that it's God's word. And if we do, it will have that impact upon us. How then can we face the future with confidence? Well, simply by recognizing that the word of God can energize our lives and that it is the truth and by taking hold of its gospel message. If we have a look at how this phrase is used, this word is used in scripture, there are many and varied ways in which it's used. Of the kingdom, of Jesus Christ, of the kingdom of God, of the grace of God, of God, of his son, of peace of Christ, of your salvation, of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed God, the everlasting gospel. So there's many and varied ways in which this word gospel is used. But do you notice there's a theme, my dear friends, which comes through from the way that this word is used. What it does is it shows us that the gospel originates from God, that it concerns his son and his future kingdom, and it is a message of 
grace, of peace, and of salvation. That's what it's encapsulated in a nutshell. That's what it's about. And so the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the believers in Rome, he spoke of the Gospel. Romans chapter 1 and the first three verses, if we have a brief look at those verses there, where he says in Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated. He was set apart unto the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he hath had promised aforetime by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What's it about? Verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And we could read on. So there it is. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. David. Now, topics which are often addressed from this platform, which is not our role this evening, are three great promises which are contained within Scripture. And the Gospel of the New Testament revolves around three great promises which appear in the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament and the New Testament are in total harmony, my dear friends, because they teach the same message. The first one is in the Garden of Eden to be found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The second one is addressed to the man Abraham, who we've referred to this evening already, in Genesis chapter 12 and other chapters which we'll refer to later. And the third to King David, who we just read of in Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So we have three promises which have wonderful common links and they all relate to the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope of salvation through him. That is the gospel message. And so it's very significant that the gospels, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, commence with the well-known words, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so we can look through the genealogy there and we can link those three important characters together, together, my dear friends. They are inseparable because they are totally connected and related in God's purpose. They are critical characters in the gospel message, the message of hope contained within the Bible. And so we have in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, some also some very, very telling words written by the Apostle Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Or another term for that would be the Gentile. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. And so in verse 16 there, my dear friends, it is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of of Christ. But we must understand what it is. 
and what it means. That verse tells us it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the power, it's the energy, my dear friends, to everyone who believeth. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we find that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. He has provided a means of salvation for us, my dear friends. And the key verse, or the key word in that verse 17 there is the word faith. It's mentioned three times in the one verse. We must believe. And our belief must develop into faith. And faith, my dear friends, is confidence that God's word will be fulfilled just as he has promised it the apostle Paul if we go back a book into the book of Acts uh, no we won't we'll stay in the same book in, in uh, Romans chapter 8 I should say the apostle Paul speaks of being saved by hope. Act, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. The Apostle Paul says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? The dialogue translation of the Bible is, a little more accurate because it has there we are saved by the hope so there is a particular or a defined hope my dear friends and the attitude of course of many in uh, religious circles these days is it doesn't really matter what you believe you will be saved but sadly they don't understand that there is the hope and that is what we must understand. There is only one hope by which we can be saved. And verse 25 goes on, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. In other words, we must believe the written word of God, the gospel message, and develop faith that it will be fulfilled now that hope that we've looked at there in Romans chapter 8 we'll now go back to Acts is the hope which is spoken of in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 28 Acts chapter 28 we have it up on the screen there for you Acts 28 and verse 20 this is the hope The hope as defined by the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 28 and verse 20. For this cause therefore have I called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. The Apostle Paul there speaking in Rome. And the word hope there is the Greek word elpis. It means a joyous anticipation of good with confidence. But my dear friends, it must be based on an understanding of what that hope is. You see, the Apostle Paul doesn't teach that we're simply saved by hope and they're all guaranteed salvation regardless of 
what we believe in, but rather our hope must have substance. It is the hope of Israel. And the Apostle Paul makes other references to the hope of Israel. Just a couple of pages earlier on in Acts chapter 28 and verse 6, we have similar allusion there. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. It's the same hope, my dear friends. The hope of Israel. What's the reference to the promise of God unto the fathers? Who were the fathers? Well, they were the fathers of the nation of Israel. Who was the father of Israel? We've referred to him already at this point this evening. Abraham, as referred to in Genesis chapter 12, is referred to as Abram back then. Because God called him to leave his land and go to a place that he knew not of. And God made great promises to him. And we don't, it's not the purpose of our evening this evening to look at them. But in Genesis 12, 13, 17 and 22, great promises were made to that that man, Abram. We've got a brief summary of them. In Acts chapter 7. Now, there was a devout man devout man by the name of Stephen. And he was accused of various things. And he was dragged before the council of elders. And he gave an account of himself. And in Acts chapter 7, verses 1 to 5... We read these words. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. That's where it started. When he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from thence when his father was dead uh, was dead he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And so, verse 5 in particular, my dear friends, is what we are particularly interested in. There's a promise which has not yet been fulfilled. That means that it's still to be fulfilled. It's in the future. It was promised to him. Who's him? Him is Abraham, as we have in verse 2. And his seed, his descendants. The seed of Abraham that the Bible speaks of is the Lord Jesus Christ. We refer to Matthew 1 and verse 1. And so the scripture tells us that we can be joined to the Lord Jesus Christ through baptism. We'll look at that in a few minutes. And if we're joined by covenant to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're part of Abraham's seed. And when we receive the promises made to Abraham, then we will not just inherit the land of Israel, but inherit 
the whole world. That's a broad brush approach, my dear friends, to the hope of Israel that we've been considering this evening. So, how do we know that these promises to Abraham relate to the gospel? Come back with me, if you will, to our reading this evening, Galatians chapter 3. Wonderful chapter, which we read together, and very much relates to our topic this evening. So we have in verse 6, once again, this man Abraham, obviously a very, very significant man. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. You see, Abraham had implicit faith in God. In everything that he did. Now we're just going to take a little uh, detour across to Hebrews chapter 11 and come back to Galatians chapter 3 in a minute. Because Hebrews chapter 11 demonstrates for us the faith of this man Abraham. And we have that for us in verses 8 and 9. By faith Abraham. And once again in verse 9. By faith he sojourned and so on. So all his actions were demonstrated by faith. But come across to verses 17 to 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, if we want to check the record, Genesis chapter 22 is the record of this incident. Where God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac and to sacrifice him. To kill him. And he as good as did it. And in, in his own mind he had done it because he had performed obedience to God's word. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And it says there that it was because of this that he received the promises. Verse 19. Verse 18. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 19. According, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, in type, Isaac was dead. But it was the demonstration of Abraham's faith that earned him the promises. So if we come back to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7, we read, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And as we've seen there in Hebrews, my dear friends, Abraham was such an amazing example of faith. He was prepared to kill his own son, sacrifice his own son for God. That God proclaimed, as we have here in verse 7 of Galatians chapter 3, that anyone who shows the faith of Abraham can be referred to as Abraham's children. That's what that's telling us. And that is how we can be related to Abraham. If we have the faith of that man, we can be his children. We put up on the screen there the Diagots translation of verse 8 of Galatians chapter 3, which reads, And the scripture, having foreseen that God would justify the nations by faith, previously announced glad tidings to Abraham that in thee shall all the nations be blessed. In other words, 
God would provide a way of hope by faith. And he has. That's exactly what he's done. The AV, the authorised version that you probably have on your lap, says, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So the gospel preached to Abraham, it was preached before the law of Moses was preached to Israel in the wilderness. So whilst the term, my dear friends, as we've seen, only appears in the New Testament, clearly the message of the Old Testament is the gospel message. But how is the gospel summarised? It's summarised in those words we referred to earlier on from, Galatia, uh, from Genesis chapter 12. In thee, Abraham... In thee shall all nations be blessed. In other words, all those who show the faith of Abraham will be blessed. So whilst we're still here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The New American Standard Bible says so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer that's exactly what he was Abraham the believer so if we want to be blessed with Abraham friends we must believe the gospel just like Abraham did we go over the page then to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 where we read now to Abraham and his seed where the promises made. He saith not and to seed as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. It's very, very clear. It's very, very simple is it not my dear friends. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And to thy seed. If you, have a, if you have a Bible with a margin in the middle, you'll find that that's a direct quotation there from Genesis 13 and verse 15. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is the seed, the descendant promised of Abraham. And so let's go across then to verses 28 and 29 or 26 to 29 I should say of this same chapter of Galatians chapter 3 for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus and then we come to the crunch line. Verse 29. And if ye be Christ's. So if we put on Christ through baptism. Then ye are Abraham's seed. And is according to the promise. We can inherit the promises made to Abraham. That's what that tells us. If we put on Christ through baptism. That is the hope of the gospel. If we, to, if we are to be heirs according to the promise. We must put on Christ through baptism. So the other part of our Bible lecture titled this evening my dear friends then relates to the kingdom of God. And the hope of the Bible is that the kingdom of God will be established upon this earth. Now, for that to happen, a number of things have to happen, have to happen first of all. The Lord Jesus Christ himself 
has to return. And we believe that the first chapter of Acts demonstrates that he will. Acts chapter 1 and verses 10 and 11. Where we read after the Lord Jesus Christ has been taken up in verse 9. We read, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, which is where he went. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Said also, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So the Lord Jesus Christ must return visibly and physically, as it's described there. To this earth from heaven. That's what the Bible says. And when we go to such prophets as Jeremiah and consider what Jeremiah's message is, it's very, very clear and very plain. Because Jeremiah tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to not only return to this earth, but he's going to reign upon this earth. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 17 tells us these words. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all nations shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. So, for this to happen, the Lord Jesus Christ clearly has to return. Those words there in verse 17 have not yet been fulfilled. What do we see around the world, uh, in the world when we look around ourselves? these days my dear friends what we see is the latter part of that verse look at the carnage that we see on every hand just in these last few days in the states the imagination of their evil heart it's just pure evil which we see demonstrated all around the world but what that verse tells us is that Jerusalem is set to be the new capital of the world. That's never happened before. So it's still a verse which is speaking of the future. And my dear friends, it's a real future. It's speaking of a new world order which God is going to establish upon this earth. And it's going to be God-centred, not man-centred and the prophet Isaiah confirms these things for us speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ the seed of Abraham in Isaiah chapter 9 beautiful words that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ descriptive words verse 6 and unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Or that's the Hebrew word Ail. Means power. The Mighty Power. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Very, very descriptive words. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David. David. The promises were made to King David. And the Lord Jesus Christ will sit on David's throne and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment 
and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. My dear friends, those verses are describing there for us things that we can't even imagine in this world at the moment. A ruler that judges with true and righteous judgment and justice. But that is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns to this earth. We have further words by the prophet Isaiah in in Isaiah chapter 11. Once again, Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 1 to 5. Words which, once again, describe the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. <laughs> so it's all connected. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall judge after the sight. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. You see, those verses there describe the qualities and the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that, aren't they the characteristics of a ruler that this earth badly needs? Badly needs, my dear friends. The Son of God is the only one who will have the authority and the power to do the things described there in those verses there. And then the chapter goes on. We don't have time to look at it this evening. But certainly from verses 6 to 9 describes the harmony that will be put in place by the Lord Jesus Christ. The restoration of things as they were at the creation in the beginning. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 19. He foretold what would happen. Matthew chapter 19 and commencing at verse... Well, verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Verse 28 says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration. That's the key word there, my dear friends. The regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. That's still to happen. Ye also shall sit on the, 12 tri on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The word regeneration there means a rebirth, a new birth. That's when God's kingdom will be established upon this earth. It's going to be like a new birth. Verse 29, he goes on, he says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. That is the message of the gospel, my dear friends, and that is the glorious hope 
that is being held out to us. And so we could consider passages such as Psalm 72, which is a beautiful chapter which paints a word picture of what the earth will be like under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. The changes which will occur in the earth and a new system of government which will be established upon this earth under the wise rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will see a total transformation of this world and doesn't it need it, my dear friends. And so the message of the Bible which we've considered briefly this evening is a vital message for us today. We must accept that the Word of God is true and reliable. That it's our handbook to daily living. That it's able to guide us to salvation. Eternal salvation as we have there in Matthew 19 and verse 29. But we must firstly believe. What must we believe? Well, we read it in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the first century, with that belief, what action did those believers take? They were baptised. We saw that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. And many, many examples through the Acts and so on. As many of you as, many of you as have been baptised into Christ and put on Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We come then to Matthew 6 and verse 10. We recognise that, my dear friends, as being a small segment of the Lord's Prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. May we echo those words, my dear friends, and we pray that God's kingdom will soon be established upon this earth under the righteous rule of our Lord Jesus Christ in peace.